So hello everyone and welcome to our session today on Inside Real-Time Production, the tools to make it sick. My name is Aikhar Hineralao, I'm a CEO and one of the co-founders of ICVR. My name is Chris Switek, co-founder and chief of product at ICVR. Um, so to give a bit of history about our company, we started um, ICVR in back 2016 with other uh, veterans of game industry. And one of our main focus was uh, to merge interactive and narrative through the medium of virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, but through past years, we have grown into um, three key verticals where we have IC Studio, it's our gaming division where we help um, uh, larger game studios uh, with develop tool development and art creation. Um, and as well, we produce full cycle games in house. We have uh, ICVR, which is our main um, outside facing brand, which is still focusing on immersive technology and through the past uh, three years on virtual production, um, such as in camera visual effects, real time animation, live broadcast, etc. And the uh, IC tools, which is our tuning and pipeline department, where we help uh, companies uh, into implementing their like, production pipelines and building the uh, productivity tools inside the real-time engines for uh, the creatives or for engineers. Um, and pa uh, past, uh, six months ago, we joined, so we joined uh, Unreal Partners program, uh, where we are working together with Epic in uh, deploying uh, uh, different tools to the studios. Um, and so today what we want to talk about a bit, uh, it's about the real-time animation and the workflows around that. So through past uh, three to four years, we've seen a rise of uh, uh, creatives utilizing game engines to do the animated or full CG content. We, you probably saw also a lot of things happen in the ICV effects uh, space. Um, but one, one of the main uh, points why it, uh, it started propagating through this industry is because you now you're able to iterate inside of the engine together with your previous team, virtual art department, slicing department. Um, and uh, what we inherited in the real-time animation still this kind of linear workflow. We, through past years with uh, the pipeline, kind of started being stacked on top of each other and the starting, uh, department starting uh, working more. But it creates a, a pretty big logistical challenge from production side and from um, a tuning side. Especially with existing legacy pipelines that people have been working with for years and years and years, that transition becomes very difficult and there's a big need for tooling. Um, and so here's uh, an idea pretty much of uh, how car current workflows looks, but then in there you start having a lot of bottlenecks. When you have multiple departments stacked on top of each other and uh, passing files be in between each other, um, and you have this like round trips between, different, between Unreal to different DCCs, um, then it's becoming uh, uh, problematic. And from production standpoint, it's also uh, a big problem where like, you have one department, it's dependent on the next one. And so on, for this type of project, it's very important to see where like, the uh, bottlenecks are and how they can be resolved. Um, and me, uh, my background, it's, uh, I was a producer, a uh, game producer for a long time, and uh, I'm currently executive producer of majority of my project, uh, of the projects. So that's what we're fighting. It's the uh, kind of like our burn rate and our team velocity. And so in internal production um, and when we come consulting to other clients, we're trying to identify the uh, places where actually we had the ideal burn down and when the, we have the remaining tasks are piling up and we see how we can resolve that and how we can optimize your burn-down rate and uh, make your production much smoother. And project after project, we're realizing that pretty much we repeat a lot of tasks. 
So, a bit of background on our art department. We uh, started doing digital humans back like 2017, and we've uh, helped a lot of uh, visual effects studios, a lot of game studios on creating uh, face rigs and, and, and game characters. And we realized through pretty much every project, we're repeating the same tasks. And I'm sure, like, whoever did face rigs or like any rigs or any modeling, you've saw these fox poses like hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, and so our original process was with, when we worked with photogrammetry, it was to, we would use reality capture, we would run the program, we would um, create new project, we would add all of the pictures from the scan, um, we would run, um, uh, we would run the software, we would wait, and then do it again, and then go and move to another software, and pretty much constantly repeat this process. Um, and when we started observing our artists who are working on that, each, each of these steps, it's a wait time. And each of the steps, it's a, but it has to be a manual input. And we started observing that there are a lot of uh, uh, wasted effort, and we were, when we were repeating it, between hundreds and hundreds of scans and throughout uh, dozens of characters uh, a project, we started looking into how can we optimize it. Um, and so one of um, um, our animation supervisors came to us and said, we can actually uh, automate majority of the stuff. And he, uh, we quickly we went and looked through the uh, script, uh, scriptables in the reality capture. We saw that majority of the commands can be automated, can be uh, pulled out to a Python script, um, and that's pretty much what came out out of it. And in total, for the previous tasks which I showed, uh, all of the steps, it took about 65 lines of code to automate that. Um, and from when we started doing the calculation, uh, basically it came out that for one character we needed to do about 97 reconstruction to build the face rig with all of the blend shapes. Um, and it was taken about uh, pretty much uh, about for a project of six, char six characters, almost uh, 587 hours saved with 65 lines of code. Um, and another area which is like often overlooked is the management side of the, pro uh, of the projects. Currently on the market there are not a lot of tools focusing on that. A lot of companies still run using like air tables or Excels and kind of like and being assembling like reports and trying to wrangle people where like for engineers you have Jira or you have Utrecht or you have kind of like uh, production of engineering focused softwares. Uh, from and they, but their all focus is to speed uh, speed up the work of engineers and kind of can give comfort and work of life. Yeah, and a great example of this uh, in real time production too is when it comes to the review process. And one of the things that we've noticed is that you know as people move to real time for more opportunities for creative iteration and efficiency, uh, we're still reviewing things in the same way. So if you're a creative, you're still looking at play blasts and turntables and renders. Uh, which is kind of ironic when the whole point of this is to be able to visualize things in engine uh, earlier on and, and see them rendered in real time. Um, and I think a big part of that too just comes from learning curve. So with creatives too, uh, especially non-technical creatives, uh, it's very difficult to teach to use Perforce, for example, and download Unreal Engine and have a, a powerful PC to run that on and learn how to use the Unreal Engine editor. Then there's also a big time uh, element to it as well. Um, there's download time for these files, there's shader compilation and so on. And a lot of time that, that's not feasible at all throughout a development for a creative, especially non-technical creative. Um, and for us as well, we usually have four to six Unreal Engine projects at any point uh, running concurrently. So for our art director to do that for three projects, um, or four projects, uh, 2.5 hours wasted is maybe a little high. It's probably more like one if you're um, doing shader compilation and big download time for a lot of changes. Um, but that adds up to a large amount of time per month just spent not doing the thing that you're really supposed to be doing, which is being able to review assets 
and scenes and shots and give feedback to the team. So one thing that we built as a solution to this is a real-time review tool. Uh, and this links up with uh, your Unreal Engine project on source control uh, and also your uh, production database. And here it, it, we're using ShockGrid. Um, and you can locate any asset of your project within ShockGrid. Uh, click on a review link and it'll open a new tab for you there. Uh, and this tool uses pixel streaming to take the Unreal Engine editor and stream it to the person reviewing the asset. And it'll open directly to the asset that you clicked on. And this is advantageous because it launches quickly. Uh, you can do it on the go. You don't need a powerful computer. You can use a 10-year-old 10, 10 MacBook Air if you want. Um, and it allows you to see these scenes, shots, and assets in context within the engine. Uh, it also has a simplified user interface, so it's a lot easier for people to pick it up and learn to use it. Um, and it allows you to leave feedback uh, within the scene in 3D space. And that feedback will sync with uh, ShockGrid, automatically create tasks uh, that can then be assigned to artists, and it'll also sync with Unreal Engine. So if you're working within the engine, um, you can see these comments in a separate sub-level within the scene, and artists don't need to be tabbing out uh, in order to see what they need to do. And that kind of goes back to the idea of you want people working within the space that they should be working, not doing tasks outside of that. Um, so we find this tool really useful, especially early on in development. Um, I think, you know, later on when you're trying to put together final shots, you still want to see high resolution renders. Um, there is some compression that happens as you're streaming this, but especially for things like scene building and previs and block out, um, as you start to assemble scenes, it's really, really useful to just be able to pull things up quickly and not go into Unreal Engine. And uh, this can be, uh, in our company, we, our game designers as well um, have pretty big use to that to review the level, uh, level design and kind of be able to quickly run through the scenes as well because you don't need to go, like Chris said, go to Perforce, go to your Git, pull stuff and wait for it to compile. Yeah, and, and I mean, even having the project downloaded, uh, like for me as well, I'm, I'm very Unreal Engine literate, but sometimes it is just easier to go to ShockGrid and, and click this and have it instantly launch into the asset in terms of picking, you know, in, in uh, comparison to picking through the project uh, and trying to locate it there. So we find this very, very useful for us in our day-to-day -day work with Unreal Engine. So here's some examples of individual tools that address specific pain points, um, but you know, what if we take these ideas and try to apply this to a whole pipeline? Because at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that we believe too is that your production is only as fast as your slowest bottleneck. So what if we try to address all the bottlenecks that we run into, all the repetitive things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and we try to build tools for that? So one of the main concepts is that uh, how we approach it, it's a connected workflow that Every team member interacts with each other, and the, our company is uh, split between uh, two continents and about four different locations. Um, and from our side, when we started building it, um, building our um, CICD and pretty much building our uh, company infrastructure, we were always looking into how do you interconnect everybody together and how do you make sure that you track across each production every asset, every, um, every entity, every commit, and make sure that we can, other person sitting in their home or in, of, in the other office um, is able to pull it and use it. And from management standpoint, how can we make sure that we track all of the time spent and be able to um, uh, coordinate the production efficiently? Because still for everybody, it's, it's same uh, concept, we have limited time and we have limited budget. And so efficiency is one of our um, key looks. Um, and uh, the, after that, when we started scaling our company across uh, multiple projects, uh, and like Chris said, for example, we have from four to six projects concurrently going in Unreal, and in general, as a studio, we have about um, seven to eight projects in, uh, in average in production. 
Um, we started uh, looking into a um, uh, concept of an ecosystem, um, specifically around that the um, uh, assets or tools which are built around each pr one production need to be easily scalable across of all of the other productions. And you need to be able to propagate any update to, on the one tool which you did across all of the productions. Um, same goes around, I want to uh, touch a bit on the uh, asset management side. Um, across board, we see um, a large, waste, uh, large amount of wasted effort on redoing same assets again and again. There, we are, the big use currently with, uh, of Quixel and of other like in store assets, but within the studio, um, it's crucial to be able to track what the asset in which state it was built, um, and then that it's archived properly, and from there we're able to pull it back and reuse it in another project. And, and just be able to search, yeah. be able to find these assets that you want in an intelligent way. Um, because we all did probably like, um, hundreds and hundreds uh, mock-up sessions with uh, work cycle, different work cycles, um, um, like same as like rocks and chairs, and there are a lot of uh, things which are very similar across board, across projects, and you don't need, as a, for example, as a modeler or sc sculptor, you don't need to start your model in ZBrush from, uh, from a primitive. You can pick up just a base, uh, base mesh from a previous project, and just sculpt what you need for, for this project. And it saves an uh, enormous amount of time at scale. Um, and so we kind of came out with um, this production pipeline concept, uh, which is like for us, it's the baseline framework of what you need for um, a real-time production. And on the main part, it's um, if you start on the right, um, you have the um, DCC plugins, which are pretty much interconnect um, all of your um, DCCs into one unified ecosystem from where you can track objects and uh, track your publishers and distribute the tasks. You have the Unreal-centric plugins. Here we have mentioned we have the short grid or like a basic production management database tracking. Um, and we have the uh, breakdown of plugins, which are basically analyzing what's happening within the engine. Um, and the la last, we have the uh, render uh, plugins, which are focused on the uh, pretty much rendering outputs. And also we have the automation uh, on the farm for different tasks, which we're gonna dive deeper a bit. You wanna discuss that now or okay. later on? Okay. Yeah, so uh, the main part of the uh, bootstra bootstrapping and one thing which we found uh, within our productions, again, that we have a lot of wait times. One of the first examples which we gave earlier it was the automation with the reality capture side where like you have a manual repetitive tasks which can be automated with 65 lines of code. For some of the tasks, it's even less. Uh, but for some, it's a lot more. Yeah, for some, it's a lot more. <laughs> Uh, but the but the main point about that that you each of these tasks taking out uh, the machine time of your engineer or artist um, uh, and for us like one of the most important parts that you keep focusing on your work and you keep focusing on the creation creative side and not wait. So uh, sometimes it's good because you can go like drink a coffee, maybe smoke a cigarette, but. It's uh, at scale, it's becoming very problematic because uh, if you wait for, let's say, like 30 minutes, 40 minutes for Alembics to, to cache and then another 30, 40 minutes for them to import, or you wait for like uh, 30 minutes to an hour to bake your lights in a scene, basically you can uh, waste half of the day uh, whenever you ship the projects. And majority of the tasks that happen during assembly and so you burn in and you have maybe like a couple days left before you need to ship the project. Um, so from our side, we are looking heavily and we are automating the internal uh, side, like everything what we can offset from a local machine um, to a remote machine. Uh, how Chris showed the uh, previous example with the uh, review tool, you can automate same way, like I was saying, the light baking, you can asset export import, um, pretty much, and everything else across DCCs. 
So one of the things too, um, looking at studios that are trying to start working in real time, transitioning, um, is that there's a lot of very, very common uh, pain points, and as a result, needs that arise from this. Uh, and I think one of the best examples of that too, with the graph that you can see here, is just asset flow. So working within Unreal for you know to assemble your scenes you need to be able to take assets out and in uh, and through all of your various different DCCs. And you need to be able to do this over and over and over and over again throughout any production. So because this is such a, a repetitive task being done by so many people, it's important to be able to do it really efficiently. Um, and you know, smaller teams, uh, smaller projects, you can get away um, with a without a lot of automation for this process. But once you start working at scale, as Igor talked about, uh, it just really cuts into production time in a really, really big way. So even things that allow you to save a small amount of time during this process, because it's so repetitive, uh, over the course of one production end up being a huge time and money saver. And from a uh, pr production standpoint also, we look, uh, as Chris mentioned, one point about searchability of the assets and ability to transfer and uh, import asset, uh, correct asset and correct version of the asset inside of the project. And like we show in this graph, like the uh, real-time pipeline just grows and we constantly have new tools which are having new formats, which uh, for example, like good example currently, like uh, Marvel's designer and Houdini becoming a pretty uh, solid piece of the pipeline for the clo closed team and like other um, more heavy simulations for the game and for, for games of virtual production. You uh, surfacing and kind of texturing stack, it's all, all this constantly increases. Remember when we used to do pretty much everything, all the textures in Atlas and Photoshop, today you might do use the, uh, get the base texture out of uh, photogrammetry scan, which you're gonna be retouching in Mari. From Mari, you're gonna bring in it to uh, most likely to substance and from substance wherever you want to bake it, with the studios baking it in Marmoset or other tools. And so just to do one specific task, you can jump three, four softwares and the same goes to the... And end up with like 10 files along the way for what ends up being one single asset within Unreal Engine. And same goes to like modeling or, um, uh, or animation where see people still jumping between uh, Maya, Blender, uh, Z, uh, 3D Max, because majority of DCCs, they have a very unique um, things which they can do really good. And whenever, just out, because our studio works on a lot of various projects, sometimes we need to be able to get out from one DCC which we used to, to another one, because we can't achieve what we need to the original DCC. So in, in order to help solve these problems, um, we've kind of looked at, at four specific needs, four, four specific things that need to be done for this. Uh, number one, which I think is obvious based on what we've talked about, is just automating workflows as much as possible. Uh, that, that's the first key to efficiency, is just removing the need to do tasks. And second, in addition to that, is source control, is extremely important. Um, we come from the game space, so it's, you know, we, we work with it every day. Um, but especially in media and entertainment, it's kind of a, a new concept, especially coming from uh, older, more linear workflows. Um, and we believe, of course, you're gonna have your Unreal Engine project uh, stored on source control, but we believe it's essential to have every asset that you're working with throughout this pipeline, even assets that are external to Unreal Engine, uh, saved on source control. And of course, if you're gonna update you know, one of these 10 files that pieces together to, to form what looks like one thing in Unreal Engine, if any piece of that is edited, uh, you need to be able to instantly update that asset within Unreal. Uh, and also the other important part of it too is publishing integration at every step. Uh, working with Shockgrid or another similar analog, you need to be able to track the status of all these assets and get a picture of the production as a whole so you know what's going on. Um, and it's important to do that at every step along the asset journey. So that means for every DCC that you're working with in your project, you need integration uh, for publishing and source control to make sure that nothing slips through the cracks. Um, and overall, 
there's kind of broad tools, but every production is a little bit different. So it's really, really important to look at your uh, workflow, see what's going on, talk to your artists, talk to the people working on this, uh, find your bottlenecks and eliminate them. Because you know, going back to the phrase before, you know, your production is kind of only as fast as your slowest bottleneck. So you're constantly fighting a, a battle against them. Um, so uh, we'll take a little look through this uh, kind of baseline toolkit framework that Igor talked about earlier. And we'll do this from the perspective of one asset. Uh, we're going to start in Unreal Engine with this asset. Uh, it's gonna be a windmill. You'll see it in the, in the next slide. We'll take it out of Unreal, go into Blender to see what that process is like for uh, finalizing the asset geometry. We'll take it from Blender to Substance in order to do surfacing. And then we'll take it back into Unreal. Um, and we'll take a look at uh, taking it into Maya for the final uh, animation and, and layout step of dealing with this asset in the, in the context of the scene. Um, so starting with Unreal. Uh, oh, I guess to, to qualify as well. So um, these tools and these examples are built on uh, open source ShockGrid desktop, which is nice for us because we use ShockGrid. It provides a lot of out of the box functionality, which it takes care of. Um, but these tools are also agnostic of that. Uh, we have a standalone version of these, and also in working with studios in order to integrate this into their pipelines, uh, we've also been able to make this pretty modular so that we can also apply it to existing uh, legacy pipeline tools uh, in order to make sure that the people that have been using these things for years uh, are able to do that in a, a comfortable way in the same context. So to start this process off, um, we have a block out of a windmill. Uh, for us, we like to do as much uh, kind of original asset discovery, if you will, in Unreal uh, during the previous phase. So we, we block stuff out, drop it in the scene, see what looks good, see where the placement fits. Um, and then we generally start this process by exporting a lot of these block outs from Unreal and then turning them to final. Um, but of course, you don't need to do that. Uh, a lot of times an asset's life will start in Maya. Uh, or Blender, or whatever you're using to do the initial modeling. But one of the key points, though, for us, like uh, to start it in Unreal and going uh, and having this our kind of, uh, base play base place from where we export you know, all of our blockouts to the DCCs, is that we can keep consistency of the um, scale and the coordinate systems, and that we can easily update them throughout the life of the uh, life of the asset back into the project, and at every point of iteration, um, you can have your project being built up on top of, uh, of it. Um, to, because, like you said, we're coming from a game development primary, and for us, we uh, always working through pretty much the same workflow, where we have the- Gray box, uh, everything. Like, gray box, yeah. vertical slice, and alpha, and beta, and release, and we constantly building on top of, on top of the assets. See, like in, for real-time animation specifically, we um, implementing the same uh, uh, the same concept. So to show this in action, um, pretty simple process. Uh, we use a, a separate sublevel for all our blockout stuff. Uh, we'll locate our asset, select it, and click publish. Uh, and what this does is, uh, with the shock grid integration that you see here, it, it obviously puts it to shock grid. Um, but it's also gonna export as an FBX from Unreal Engine. Uh, it's gonna track that on source control and make sure it's versioned. Uh, and then from there, we're going to be able to work with it in our various different DCCs that we work with in the pipeline. Uh, so to quickly give like an overall look at how storage works, because I think this is really important to understand some of the next steps, um, this is a look at a Perforce repository a uh, little sample repository for this project. And of course you have your Unreal Engine project that's gonna be stored on source control. Um, but in addition to that, going back to what I said earlier, uh, we also use an assets folder uh, where we store all of our external assets, the, even the stuff outside of Unreal Engine, all of the artist's working files, uh, all of the uh, project files, and the million different various file formats that you saw in that big ugly graph on the previous slide. And then that way we can make sure uh, that whenever a change is made, you instantly get that change reflected in Unreal Engine. 
Uh, and for example, in this previous step, as we publish that FBX of the windmill blockout, what that's doing is creating that asset within the assets folder that you can see here within the repository. And then it can get picked up by other DCCs uh, to work with and finish the steps, which Igor will walk you through. So our next step is we, the asset travels from Unreal to Blender to be modeled out. Um, and like I said, the key part from exporting from Unreal, you will retain the um, scale and your coordinate systems, and you're setting up the base kind of like metadata tag, which is going to follow this asset across the full ecosystem, and to be able to update it, uh, update it very easily in uh, back in Unreal, and also to make it searchable in the future, because you can inject pretty much the context of where this asset was used, how it was used, what is it, etc. Um, and uh, one of our core um, core focuses always, if you want to start playing the video, mm -hmm. um, it's to keep consistency of our tools across uh, all of the softwares which our like artists or engineers use. Um, and so, like I said, we keep uh, similar UI, and the uh, pretty much workflow is very similar. Where you go, preselect your task, load in. Um, uh, load in the asset, which is like dedicated to this task, um, and it's automatically imported from uh, Perforce into the scene, and uh, your artist can uh, work, start working on it. And yeah, and I think one, I mean, one key thing here is that you don't see having to open P4V as an artist in order to sync the project or get the latest changes. Um, you don't need to you know, directly interact with source control. And we know that no artist wants to use source control. It's, it's a constant battle that we fight and I think everybody fights. Um, so how about create a way where they don't have to deal with that? And we do all the pushing and pulling from the repository behind the scenes and we load it directly into the project. And, you know, once again, going back to this, this general idea that if you're an artist, if you're modeling stuff, you don't want to leave Maya ever if you don't have to. So being able to do that inside of Maya is super important. And so from there, like when we finished working on the asset, uh, the workflow is very similar as what you saw in Unreal. You're able to just right click, publish the asset, you know, shot, uh, shot, uh, shot grid opens, and you're able basically to same time, for example, validate and QC the asset if your naming conventions are right, if you mess up anything with coordinate or scale or um, any uh, um, other dependencies inside of the project, and you're able to publish it uh, to your source control and production database. Um, and from there, like the next uh, trip of the asset, it's going to surfacing. For us, in this context of this project, we are going to be uh, showing the substance painter. Um, and, and we see. Uh, uh, again, like <laughs> repeating exactly the same action. Uh, but the main part, what you see actually in the background happening across the tools that we have an array of APIs um, which automate the interaction with um, uh, short grid, with Perforce, and uh, with, your, uh, with the production uh, database where we're able to track um, all of the elements um, of the object and also set up the uh, parameters of uh, what's going to be our pipeline steps and like when the tasks need to be distributed to the next artist um, and be able to set up also the QC elements for the project. And after we completed the surfacing inside of uh, Substance, um, we're going to export and here again the importance of the ecosystem that we are sharing a um, uh, array of presets for publishing with artists that as uh, it's constantly updated and they're like set up by the project. Um, so from there like we can make sure that the whatever each artist published um, it's uh, pretty much QC'd, it has the correct naming conventions, it has correct uh, uh, setting, export settings uh, and uh, like uh, material color spaces, etc. 
because we um, started seeing one of the um, uh, parts that a lot of QC, it's actually uh, where assets are rejected, going mostly around the uh, um, kind of manual work, just entering wrong name or doing uh, something, uh, like setting up one wrong value on your scale, like, like set of centimeters using meters. And uh, like in one of the first slides when we were saying we have the um, overlapping departments with each other which passing task to another, it became a um, wasted effort where like somebody waits, uh, need to wait to receive the asset for, to do his task because the name convention was, was done wrong or the scale was done wrong and now you need to go back into Maya or other DCC and change it and republish it and doing all of this work well. And also make sure your supervisors uh, don't lose their minds because that's the, the most frustrating thing is to have to push stuff back for you know, naming convention <laughs> issues or other small changes. Yeah, all you engineers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so from there, from uh, when we completed these two DC steps, we basically coming back into Unreal. Um, and you can see, and uh, you can see here that we uh, basically able to, as Chris mentioned before, we are able to reimport the same asset and track the uh, all of the changes done to it, because when we started publishing, we published our first FBX out of. Uh, Unreal, it's, uh, we got attached to our production uh, database and now each, uh, each of the dependencies were written on top of it and added to it. And so the, um, our main focus on that is not to do a destructive workflow, but to do additive that you able, every file which is created across the, pi uh, the pipeline is stored and uh, cataloged properly. And then you can very easily uh, reload it in the project with a couple of clicks without needing to search um, uh, across your database or looking what the, um, what the correct files are needed for this task. Um, yeah, and you can see as it, as it comes in with that stored uh, coordinate system, being able to remember that between all this different all these different DCC processes, you're able to drop this in directly on top of this FBX that you originally exported from the beginning. Um, so it's placed in the world, ready to go, ready to start doing look dev uh, and integrating it into your final layout. And one, one thing which was mentioning also about the, what I was talking about the automating through APIs is the interaction that when we imported the asset, we automatically created the uh, correct folder structure and uh, name convention for the imports. You can see on the um, lower right. And also the materials and textures are automatically assigned at the import and at every update. And let's say when the, um, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we told the artist to make the texture darker, uh, we just need to, and it was the task was completed, Substance Painter, we just need to do a right click and reload the uh, texture asset and basically to, to have it updated inside of the project. So I believe this is um, going out yeah. uh, to Maya for this next step. And so one of the important things which we're focusing also is the um, uh, data transfer and the, uh, and the currently the data sizes of the packages just growing exponentially. I think we all enjoyed Nanite, um, how it allows you to create this beautiful massive environments around, but also they are all of them are <laughs> Not like- good for file size. <laughs> <laughs> like 10 or up to 100, we have environments which are like up to 100 GBs. Um, so whenever we distribute the tasks for our animators, we always publish uh, reference assets for consistency. That your animator, if you want to animate the windmill or the character working around, uh, walking around they need asset to, and to see like what the camera is used and what's kind of like the pathway. Um, because of that, we can't, we used to before export the full scene, but uh, I was saying with uh, like August, just in general, the file size is massive, and um, our DevOps saying we have a limited uh, bandwidth of our, our VPN, so 
uh, we're making sure to minimize um, uh, we're making sure to minimize the amount of what we're passing off, and so be able, like we're saying, like uh, one of our main goals to be able also as well to round trip the assets. So we imported something into Unreal. We can export a newly updated asset in out of Unreal into, like, let's say Maya for animation. And taking a look at the final part of this, um, the so, Maya import. And so whenever we import, uh, whenever we start animating in Maya, we're able to uh, import basically uh, our uh, see our exported scene. Uh, with references, which where we retain our like uh, cameras, we retain our coordinate system and scale, like I'm saying again. And um, whenever artist going to be animating to Maya, now we uh, when we export from Maya, we able to match it back inside the, to Unreal and to import only the animation data, and not the like reimporting the full package which saves us a yeah, pretty good amount of time on import export uh, and also like um, upload to uh, download from uh, source control. And you can see here we about to reimport the same asset. And this is kind of a kind of a boring part of the video but Talking about these tools overall, um, right now this is uh, still kind of early stage for us in, in development and rollout of these. And we've been really excited to see the, the massive demand and the massive need for this. Um, and even in an early state, there's um, a lot of studios that we've been very fortunate to work with uh, to help deploy this, working with Epic through their partner program. Um, but there's a long roadmap ahead. And our ultimate goal with this is to make these tools publicly available and as accessible as possible uh, to anybody that wants to get into real-time production or transition an existing team. Uh, and the other part of that, too, is just trying to make this as out of the box as possible. Um, so you don't need a large en engineering effort to uh, fit this into a production pipeline. And it's easy for studios to uh, be able to take on the task themselves using these tools instead of um, relying on uh, professional services as well. So I think we have uh, seven minutes left for questions. Uh, um, thank you everybody for listening for us on this. And um, I think what we want to... Uh, thank you everyone.